fear. I think people just are afraid of a lot of things. They're afraid of the future, they're afraid of their circumstances, they're afraid of what might happen, and they anticipate a lot of things. I just want to talk about that today because I think it's as common as dirt for most people in our culture and in our world today. Uh, there's a study out that says that speaking in front of a crowd is considered to be uh, the number one fear of the average person. And the number two fear is death. And uh, this means that the average person that you have to be at a funeral, uh, you would rather be in the casket than doing the eulogy. Uh, what do you call a fear of deadly snakes? Common sense. <laughs> what weapon is most feared by a medieval knight? Can opener. <laughs> of course, right? Ever since I was a child, I've always had a fear of something, someone under my bed at night. So I went to the psychologist, uh, psychiatrist and told him about the problem. Every time I go to bed, I think there's somebody under it. I'm scared. I think I'm going crazy. The psychiatrist said, uh, just put yourself in my hands for one year. Come to talk to me three times a week. And we should be able to get those fears for you. Well, how much do you charge? The doctor replied, well, $80 per visit. Well, I said, uh, I'll sleep on it, and if needed, I'll come back to you. So six months later, the psychiatrist met me on the street. Why didn't you come to see me about those fears that you had? Well, for $80, three times a week, that's an awful lot of money. A friend of mine cured me for just 10 bucks. I was so happy to have saved all that money that I went out and bought a new SUV. The doctor said, is that so? And with a bit of an attitude, he said, and how is it that your friend was able to cure you? And I just said, well, he told me to cut the legs off the bed. Ain't there nobody underneath there? <laughs> All the rich do it. Oh, brother. Everybody seems to be afraid of something. Everybody seems to be afraid of something. Height, I don't know about you, some people are very much afraid of that. My son, when it comes up to a railing, if it's more than eight feet high, he just kind of, uh, he doesn't like it. I've been on top of mountains, I've been in places where I go, why am I here? I could die here. Some people are just afraid of height. Some people are afraid of water. My grandmother was so afraid she wouldn't get into a bathtub. And when my dad and my uncle grabbed my mother, my grandmother, at a lake out there in western Minnesota, or Nebraska, on the 4th of July weekend, picked her up and took her out into the water, just knee deep, and sat her down, and she just went nuts. Just scared to death of water. I've taught adult men how to swim who were afraid to put their face in water let alone the swim. Just scared to death of water. Or perhaps you're afraid of darkness. You just, if it's dark outside, I don't want to be there. When the sun goes down, I'm afraid to be outside because of all the things that I can't see. I just don't like to be in dark places. How about needles? I don't like needles. And I remember getting one uh, full of uh, antibiotics. They used a big old steel thing with a big old needle on the end of it. When you went home, you had this big old wad on your shoulder or on the back side. Remember that? Some people are just afraid of needles. They just don't like it. Or maybe you don't like flying. My wife hates flying. She says she gets in there and she panics. She said last time we went to Hawaii years ago. And on the way over, about halfway over there, she goes, i got to get off. <laughs> well, you can't get off. Yeah, I get up, walk around a little bit, sit down, close your eyes. I mean, I'm sorry, you can't get off. She says, I'm never going to do this again. I'm never going to do this again. Some people are just afraid of flying. Some people are afraid of bats. 
It's like, oh, no, it's when they see a bat. Like, it's the end of life. Bats, or how about uh, getting old? Some people just afraid of getting old and the things that that entails. Or how about a spider or a snake? They just go insane. They just go crazy. They just lose it when they see those kinds of things. i got a guy at the church there, Rising Sun. He's very mechanical. He's a great person. He's very capable in a lot of ways. But if he crawls underneath the house and if he sees a spider, he's done. He's just done. And that little pink thing, and she goes, squash it for him. And he's done. Or perhaps you're afraid of the government. Perhaps for some reason you're afraid of the government, local or national or regional. Just what they might do or what they might not do and the difference it might make in your life. We all seem to enjoy, at least to a certain extent, the scaring of another person. Have you ever done that? Boom! Just to kind of set you up. When you walk through a room, you see that stuff on America's Family videos where people are scared, you know, they do that kind of stuff. Sometimes we just enjoy being scared ourselves, and our culture even has a holiday to celebrate it. What do we call it? Halloween. Halloween. But being afraid isn't so much fun sometimes, is it? Fear can paralyze you. It can paralyze you physically. It can paralyze you spiritually, and neither one is very healthy. So let me ask you today. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Are you afraid of people? Some people frighten you because they're big, they're powerful, they have position, they have authority, they have all these things, but Jesus reminds us who really holds the power, and it's not a man or a woman, or even what they can do to us. He tells us that we don't need to be anxious. He tells us we don't need to be afraid because our soul is very valuable to him. And he's watching us. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. Take a look, if you will, at Matthew, the 10th chapter, verses 28 to 31. These are great words. And if you hear any things that I've mentioned already today, these are some things that you might want to be memorizing and hold fast to yourself. Matthew 10, verses 28 to 31. Do not fear those who kill the body. That's pretty extreme, isn't it? It's a whole lot further than most of my fears take me. Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I'm not two sparrows sold for a cent, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Mindless every day. So, do not fear. You, say it with me, are more valuable than many sparrows. Are you afraid of people? Get over it. They don't hold the cards. Are you afraid of loss? Are you afraid of being embarrassed? Are you afraid of losing status? Are you afraid of losing position or losing influence? Are you afraid of those kinds of things? In John the 12th chapter, verses 42 and 43, there were some men who felt like that. And it says, nevertheless, many, even of the rulers, believed in him. That's Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. These leaders believed in Jesus, but they were afraid to admit it. Have you been that way? Have you been in a place like that? Have you been guilty of that as well? I have. 
If they confessed their belief that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, they would be put out of the synagogue. They would be excommunicated from the church. They would lose their position. They would lose their prestige. They would lose their reputation. And some might even think that they're nuts or crazy. They might lose their place in the public square. They might lose their place in the church. They might be an outcast. They might be shunned by some. And these men were afraid to lose all of that. They wanted the praise of men rather than God. They chose the world instead of God. They chose fear over faith. They chose death over life. What are you afraid to lose? What are you afraid to give up? What are you afraid to let go of? What is it that's standing in the way of your embracing Christ? And you know what? You're the only one who can answer that question. Are you afraid of evil? You should be. You should be. Evil, if you will, or we we'll say sin, is not a game to be played with. And we're really, really good with it. As human beings, we love to say, how far can I go? Can I get right over here to the edge? If I put one foot over the line, is that enough? Can I get away with it? Will God still honor my faith? If I stand over here for a little while and then just say, oh, God, forgive me. He'll let me right back in. And his grace is always enough. I play with evil. I'll put myself in a position I shouldn't be there. I'll do it anyway on purpose. Even with feet glad to go that direction. Sin, folks, will harm you. And it will create that for those around you. It may cost you everything. And so many think that they can just play with fire and it bears no consequence, but it always does. It always does. And my mother used to quote this scripture for me out of the Old Testament. Be sure your sin will find you out. It's really true. Be sure your sin will find you out. Sooner or later, it's going to come to fruition and you are going to be held accountable. It's guaranteed. But on the other hand, it doesn't have to control us. It doesn't have to control us. Take a look at Romans 8, chapter, verses 12 to 15. Paul writes, So then, brethren, that be you and I, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption. I love that. As sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, We've been adopted as his children, heirs according to the promise. And the relationship we have is such that we can use the Hebrew tomb term for daddy. Abba, daddy, daddy, daddy. We have that kind of access to our God. In Christ, we don't need to be slaves to fear. Are you afraid of the unknown? You're afraid of the unknown? I think most of us kind of fear what we don't know. We fear with the unidentified. We worry about the uncertainties. We worry about the what ifs of life. What if, what if, what if, what if. Conjecture like crazy. We build this household full of cards and we wait for it to happen. Not knowing what might happen what's going to happen can cause anxiety. It can cause stress. 
It can cause sleepless nights. It can cause addiction and maybe even death. But sometimes, folks, we're anxious when there is no real threat. Can I say that for you? And David knew it in Psalm 53, verse 5, where he speaks and he says, There we were, overwhelmed with dread, where there was nothing to dread. Ever been there? A panic attack? People can get caught up in fear and make decisions based on that fear. Children do it all the time, and so do adults. And their minds make it real, even if it isn't. And the result is that fear rules. And when fear rules, what do you got? Chaos. That's what you've got. And so how do we overcome that? How do we overcome that? I would suggest that we learn to be courageous. Moses encouraged the Israelite people when they entered the Promised Land to trust their new leader, a guy named Joshua. And when Moses speaks the last time of his life in Deuteronomy, the 31st chapter, he uses the word be courageous multiple times. Multiple times, and he reminds those people who have gathered there just as they're approaching the promised land that God is going to be with them. It's going to be okay. It looks tough. But it's going to be all right. And I don't think it's any different for us today. We need courage and be reminded that God is for us and with us. The Holy Spirit dwells within you. And let me just say this. Courage isn't a lack of fear. It's just doing what's necessary anyway. Perhaps you're familiar with this guy on the screen. A guy named Eddie Rippenbacher. He was a World War I ace. And he shot down 26 German planes. He won the Medal of Honor. And he said... Courage is doing what you're afraid to do. And then he goes on, he says, there can be no courage unless you're afraid. Think about that. You're not courageous if you're not afraid of it. If you're afraid of it, and you act anyway, you have some courage. We're probably not going to live a life that's absent from fear. And how we react to that fear is what matters. We're not brave until we're first afraid. And successful people, productive people of faith, learn to overcome personal fear. Learn to overcome suffering. Learn to overcome failure. They learn to become courageous. And might I suggest there's another way to deal with fear. Trust God. Proverbs 29, verse 25. Fear of man will prove to be a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Nobody can take away your life security in Christ Jesus. Only you can give it away. hear me? No one can take away your faith in Christ Jesus. Only you can
can give you. Solomon wrote this section in Proverbs. And I wonder if he was thinking about his dad, King David, when he wrote it. Because David couldn't have slain Goliath if he didn't believe those words. I pulled up this illustration today because of the age of this audience this morning. For some of you that are younger, you may not recognize this face. But her name, Corrie Ten Boom. She kept some uh, Jewish people in her household. Her parents did during World War II when they were found out. So it ended up that Corey and her sister and her family were put into the um, prison camps for World War II. Her parents died there, her sister died there. She met her guard after the war and forgave him. And she said, when it came to the tough times in her life, in my times of fear, I don't wrestle. I nestle. When it gets tough for you, find a place of solace into the arms of Jesus. For like David said in Psalm 118, the Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Sometimes I think it's hard to trust God that He's here with us. You can't feel Him. You can't touch Him. You wonder if he can hear us. And some are convinced that he's just not there. But I believe he is. And I've experienced that. I ran across an illustration that maybe will help you to understand of his presence. In some of the Indian cultures, when a boy turned 13 years old, he was taken out into the wilderness and left there overnight. And all the things that his parents had taught him were to be used to survive that night. If he didn't survive the night, if he ended up coming back to the encampment early, he wasn't considered to be a man yet. And so they would take him out and leave him there. And he had to survive that night by himself. The thing that the young person didn't know was that their father stayed with them only out of sight and out of sound to protect them if it didn't go well. But if dad had stayed with him around the campfire all night, it wouldn't have been much of a test. The test was to survive the night on his own. And sometimes we have tests, folks. It's not that God is there, but that he has given you what you need. And he wants you to learn Trust him that he is there. Had the boy known that the father was there, it wouldn't have been much of a test, and so it is with us. And whenever you face a terrible situation, realize that God is there. He says he is. Learn to trust his protection. When you're facing trials, and when you're facing trouble, when there's difficulty in your life, it's real easy to be afraid. Your finances, the bills, the medical issues you've got, the employment or lack of it, the immigration issue might be something for a few. He's brought us this far. Why would he leave us now? I love what Habakkuk says. When was the last time you read the book of Habakkuk? Can you even spell it? You know where it is in your Bible. I love what he says here in the third chapter, verses 17 and 19. Things are really tough for him. His culture has completely fallen apart. His country is going to be overwhelmed by the Persians. 
can ride a bat, not the bad motors, but the Persians after that. It's going to be bad. Lots of people are going to die. It's going to be horrible. And this is what Habakkuk says. Though the fig tree should not blossom, or shall we say the corn doesn't grow, or the beans don't sprout. And there be no fruit on the vines. Though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food. Though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls. Yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. And he has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk in high places. Have you ever seen a hind? You know what that is? It's a deer. Have you ever watched a deer? Bing, 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 bing. They're all over the place. They move quickly. They know how to dance, if you will. And the back it says, he's made my feet like hinds feet, and he makes me walk in high places. You are a child of God, he says. You. You. And you know this section of scripture as well as any. The Lord is my shepherd. Word my. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Not bare ground. Green pastures. He leaves me beside quiet waters. <coughs> he restores my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Though I walk through the valley, you ever thought about it? Walking through the valley means you're not going to be there forever, right? <laughs> the idea of through, you're going to come out the other side. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. In the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Folks, I would encourage you to have some courage. If you fear. I would encourage you to have some trust that God is that is there and that he will fulfill his promise to you. The Lord is with you and with this congregation and I encourage you with all I've got to not grow weary in well-doing. In a new season, what does it say? You will reap. <laughs> 